Well, good evening and uh, welcome to my talk on uh, Synod and Little Giants. Uh, I guess it'll be a one-off talk, uh, one-off, <laughs> so I don't let Dave off in future, uh, different <laughs> in subject matter and in style to the others, but I hope you still find it interesting. Uh, it's certainly not intended to be better in any way than the other talks, but it may be at times a bit different. <laughs> Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm a trustee of Royalstein Preservation Trust, and for the record, I'm also a life member of the Raven Glass Nest Railway Preservation Society. Um, regarding accuracy, you may notice more of a helicopter view of history in this talk, and if I make mistakes, I hope you'll correct them either in the comments or when it's launched on YouTube uh, by adding comments underneath uh, on YouTube. That way, we can create a record that may be broadly right. On the screen now is a broad guide to the scope of this talk, uh, but why is it relevant to the Rain Glass Nesta Railway? First, some of the personalities in this talk figured later at the Rain Glass Nesta Railway, and in this talk I've tried to place their activities into context. Second, in Raven Glass Railway Museum are Little Giant and Sonoda, uh, which are definitely at the centre of this talk. I should tell you that there's no slides taken at Ravenglass uh, right to the end of the talk, because there was no point uh, in my trying to beat Ravenglass Railway Museum at its own game. Uh, and there is nothing about Sir Arthur Hayward or minimum gauge railways, because this covers a different genre to that. Um, there's a book on Little Giants with a purple cover written by Robin Buttrell and John Milner. This is the place to look for more information related to this talk. Um, I'm sure they have this in the archives room at Raven Glass Railway Museum. Uh, if they don't, they certainly need it. Um, I'm grateful to John Milner, uh, amongst others, who've given me permission to use some images from his collection in this talk. Um, I can't compete with the Little Giant book, and I'm not going to try, <laughs> but I've tried to concentrate the talk on subjects that I think I know more about. This means that I'm only going to dip into selected aspects of the whole story. I hope that the talk will be informative and may be entertaining in places, although the subject matter may be a bit fragmented. Um, I hope to get right to the talk, right to the end of the talk in one go, so that next time you can return to more normal ratty subject matter. Um, there are deliberately some questions in this talk, raising issues which are over to you, as Robin Buttrell used to say. Uh, we can pick these up in Q&A uh, right at the end if you wish to. Uh, if we still got the time. Okay, so uh, um, we're now we're going to start our story in the United States. Um, and uh, we're now going to play a film, hopefully. And then, oh, share screen, okay. Right, that looks better. Hope you're all still with me. We're here today at beautiful Eden Springs with a good friend of mine, Carrie Williams. And Carrie and I have come to know, e know each other for the past couple of years, through the past couple of years, as we've worked on these Cagney locomotives and as we've prepared to bring them back here to House of, of David, to Eden Springs. And so I'm really excited to get to talk to Carrie today because I've come to learn that Carrie is one of the foremost experts when it comes to history of these miniature locomotives and not just the Cagneys but also the Herschels and the Ottaways and a lot of the different brands of locomotives that were built during the early 1900s, even the late 1800s. And so today we're going to talk to Kerry a little bit about the locomotives and specifically this locomotive that we're standing uh, by today is Kerry's, which is at its new home here at Eden Springs. And Kerry had asked us to do the best that we could in restoring this locomotive back to its original configuration right down to the color. Uh, Carrie and I spent a lot of time working on the color matching, uh, the different tones of colors, the banding on the locomotive, and all of the different things. 
And so we're going to ask Carrie a couple questions about this locomotive and about the original locomotives and about House of David. So Carrie, first of all, tell us where you gained your passion and love for these locomotives. And when I say these locomotives, specifically the Cagney type locomotives. Um, the Cagney brothers were incredible salespeople. Around the turn of the century, they saw the ability to entertain and move people around at large gatherings, uh, international festivals, fairs, the birth of the amusement park, and they were able to capitalize not only on the sale of these, but to sell the idea of letting the people's imagination to sm jump on a miniature train and go for a ride and to not only transport you from A to B in a fair situation but also be able to um, in enjoy a, a leisure ride for not only children. They initially ad addressed it for children but they rapidly found out that adults were their primary riders for these type of rides. Yeah. You know what I find interesting, Carrie, is that even in the early 1900s they were selling these locomotives all over the world. And we live in a global society today with the internet, and we can fly everywhere. But these guys got on ships and they went all over the world to sell these. They, they, with the international fairs, uh, 1898 in um, uh, Omaha, Nebraska, 1901 in Buffalo, uh, people from all over the world came to these exhibitions by the droves, by the millions. Um, and the Cagneys had a captive audience. People that had uh, large parks down in South America, uh, Africa, um, England saw also the possibilities of these. Uh, the Cagneys were able to sell the idea that they could make money for a, an investment of about $1,500. You got an engine and uh, a string of their small cars. You found a location. You set it up. Within the first year, you made your, all your money back. Yeah. The, this, was, this was a, a license to steal. Uh, <laughs> you, yeah. you were able to, you know, people just loved it. I mean, they, they said a park wasn't complete unless you had a miniature train in it. Yeah. And so many parks had trains and also the carousels, but your comment about the cost of these locomotives is really interesting because at the time, one of the early brochures, and I think the brochure that we have is even 1906 or after, it was after the 1904 World's Fair, but they were basically a dollar a pound uh, when you bought them brand new. Yeah, the, the engines were weighed in around 1,500 pounds when they were new, and they was cost you about 1,500 dollars for the train at the time. Of course then they could sell you the rail and lane all that but um, your, your initial engine um, the, the the class D which is here this is the 1904 example here um, proved, proved to be an incredible money maker and uh, both in big parks uh, Coney Island and several of the Dreamland and uh, uh, Luna Park but also individual uh, city parks found them very attractive and they ran for years and years and years. Kerry, last week at Train Festival, we were asked a number of times how many of these there were. And I remember a phone conversation between you and I where we talked about the idea that the Cagneys publicized that maybe there were a thousand of these. We don't believe that there were actually maybe a thousand. Uh, no, they, I don't think the Cagneys let the truth stand in the way of a good story. Uh, <laughs> they, they would embellish. Um, we know of about uh, 150 locations, uh, known-wise, and you might be able to multiply that by two, so maybe about 300 trains were built. But the Cagneys not only built the trains, they also leased the trains, they had many locations, um, and they bought trains back in and they traded them back out. So I suspect anything that they touched, even if they sold it for the third time, they kept adding up the numbers to get that total. Yeah. And I've, I was asked a lot also how many of these still exist, and, and I, my answer was I believe that in the states alone that maybe we have about 30 of them left. Do you believe that to be about correct? Um, I would say probably even higher than that. I really? Think, yeah, I think we might have somewhere close to 70, 80 uh -huh. still in existence. But the, the vulnerable Cagney, um, as charming and wonderful it is, um, once it was replaced by diesels in the mentioned that the progression of these parks and how they would move to diesel but carry with your eden springs here in house of david we're seeing a rebirth of some of these older parks from the early 1900s and going back to their roots which means going back to steam going back to the original so tell us a little bit about Eden Springs here and why you're trying to bring back that history. Um, well, 
Eden Springs Park uh, was purchased in 1906 by the uh, uh, religious organization called the House of David. Um, in 1908, they opened the park here with two 1904 Cagneys. Uh, they were very successful in attracting people not only to the park, but people came to the novelty of being pulled around by a train. You were dropped off by a, a trolley car up at the front depot. You boarded the little train, and it ran you around to the back part of the, the <coughs> park, where the uh, the zoo, the uh, restaurant, the uh, motel was at. The uh, You went down to the gardens, you heard music, and again, you had these trains racing around in the pavilion. They were incredibly successful at the following year. They added a third engine, um, and then over the course of time, they built, um, they rebuilt the Cagneys, and they had a, a fleet of eight at one time in the 30s, and then built two more larger engines to, in the end, in the late 40s, and ultimately the park closed in 72. Um, as a, a train lover and a lover of historic things, um, my partner and I were able to purchase the park, and with a great deal of uh, enthusiasm by local volunteers and some of our great help, uh, we've been able to um, put the trains back in on, on a limited scale, um, ultimately opening up the original mile loop that they had, and we hope to be able to attract people with the trains. And it's kind of a, a throwback to simpler times, a little more leisure period, but to show that the trains can still earn their keep as, uh, as money makers, as people movers. Yeah. We're seeing that we've got a number of parks that we're working with right now where they're buying the locomotives because they remember riding on them and they want to recreate that because they remember coming to parks like this and seeing full train loads of people, you know, ride behind these locomotives. Kerry, when this is all said and done, you're hoping to have a locomotive and how many cars and what do you hope to have for ridership as the years grow up? I know that you know that's a projection in business uh, yeah. modeling but, but a, what do you see in the future um for us it'd be extrapolation at this point but if you go on uh, similar parks um that have a track record you can easily attract 10 to 20,000 patrons annually um depending on location uh your season of runnability and your hours that you'll be open um, what other attractions you're going to have for the people once they're there. But there are many locations that strictly have the train and they easily go from uh, 12 to 25,000 in annual uh, revenue just based on the attraction of the train. Yeah. Let's go back to the train for a minute. Kerry, there were a number of things that you asked us to do with this locomotive. <laughs> okay, so, uh, um, so I hope you enjoyed that short film as an introduction to, to, to my talk about uh, um, Little Giants, although uh, you can see we've uh, sneaked some Cagney engines into the start of it. Uh, uh, so, so there's some questions for you, having watched that film. Uh, 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 where is the world's oldest location of a 15-inch gauge railway? Well, talking about a railway that's still there now and a railway that was 15-inch gauge uh, originally, it had to be surely uh, House of David, Eden Springs Park, which 1908. So if you're on the internet and you know a 15 inch gauge railway that's still there, that's early in earlier than 1908, uh, please put the answer in the comments. Um, in the absence, I'm going to say that Eden Springs Park uh, is three years earlier. We're 1911 real miniature railway, Southport's 1911, Eden Springs Park is 1908. Um, how many locomotives did the Cagney brothers build and sell in total? Well, <laughs> in the film, he reckons about 300. Um, I, I think there's got to have been at least 200, and the answer is between two and 300. So there you are. Um, it's quite quite amazing uh, the amount of business. I'm still synced with the TV. That that these um, uh, Cagney you brothers. Okay, well, <coughs> did, did some of these uh, engines come over to the, some <coughs> of these trains come over to the UK? Yes, they sure, they sure did. And uh, here are a few images to prove that they did. This is uh, the Glasgow exhibition of 1901. Yes. Are you seeing the Glasgow exhibition of 1901? Yep. Yes. Hey, hey, that, right, that's the end of the technological troubles. Okay. So now we're at Glasgow in 1901, and you should now see another Glasgow picture, yes? Yes. 
Lovely. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, uh, well, well, there's a better picture of the Glasgow train. Uh, the driver there seems a bit young to me, and you do wonder what sort of a competence records he had, because he doesn't look particularly over the age of 21 to me. The 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 uh, the cars at the Glasgow exhibition were quite small. They weren't the standard uh, Cagney bogey cars. There's a, there's a better view of them. Uh, you'll find that some of my so-called archive pictures are culled from eBay, and that's definitely culled from eBay. <laughs> it's a lantern slide that was auctioned on eBay. <laughs> and there's a, another one of uh, Glasgow. Um, this, this Wolverhampton exhibition, uh, uh, 1902, well, I can't go wrong on what year it was because it's there in the artwork. Now, I didn't find that artwork. I think that John Tidmarsh found it, uh, so I should uh, credit him. Uh, and uh, as, as, as we are at the moment, um, no actual pictures or press cuttings of that railway have come to light, but there clearly was a railway there, might have been 15 inch gauge or 12 and 5 eighths uh, gauge that Cagney also supplied. So that's a, a bit of research that's still to be done to uh, pin down what sort of a railway that that was. And this is the railway at White City, Manchester. Um, <laughs> now, um, the White City, Manchester is an attraction opened in 1907. Uh, there's, a, there's a very uh, wonderful brochure for it in 1909. And the railway was definitely there by 1909. And it was still open 1911. And of course, at the outbreak of the First War, it closed. Here's one or two more pictures of it. Uh, an interesting railway, the White City Manchester Railway. Uh, um, you can see the Cagney there, but uh, the, the coaches seem to be homemade on Cagney bogies. It's at Liverpool Exhibition, um, 1913. Quite a well-known um, uh, image with uh, some unreliable tinting of the of the colours. It starts getting more interesting. Here we've got a, a company called WH Bond & Co that ran Cagney Railways in the UK in, in more than one place. And uh, that's their railway at the Festival of Empire in 1911 uh, at uh, Crystal Palace, going round and round a fountain at Crystal Palace. Uh, the um, picture's been around uh, for a little while, but uh, as I'm about to tell you, um, new facts about uh, the Bond & Co have uh, recently come to light. Um, well, my friend Peter Scott uh, is researching railways of Skegness, and he's pretty near to publishing a, a great, huge, long book about railways of Skegness. And if you keep an eye on his website, which is minorrailways.co.uk, uh, when it comes out in the next six months, certainly, you might be able to buy a copy of it. Because the Bond people were involved in the Skegness Railway, he's done research into them and to their other railways. Uh, and in the South End and Westcliff graphic <laughs> for, for August 1910, by a, a, a great deal of scrutinizing through um, uh, newspapers, he found that lovely image of the Bond Railway in South End's White City, 1910. Well, I think that the um, that railway, that's a railway after my own heart because they haven't spent too much money, uh, but um, they've got a Cagney train of the typical type. And they're obviously trying to take the Cagney brothers' advice and try and get their money back as soon as possible. <laughs> um, as we've done other Cagneys for the record, uh, is the real Cagney number 44 with its owner in uh, South Carolina, Elliot Springs. Um, uh, the, the railway was next to a swimming pool and that's uh, Gypsy Rose Lee on the, on the foot plate. <laughs> and there for the record is uh, James Waterfield. I can see James is watching. That's, that's his Herschel Spillman engine in its original life in New Zealand. So I've shown you some examples of uh, Cagney Railways in the UK. Haven't done the whole story, deliberately haven't been to them all, haven't been to places like Blakesley Hall and have missed a couple of Earl's Court Railways out and missed the one out at, at, at San Alexandra Palace. Don't aim to, to tell you about them all, but I've given you an idea that all this was going on uh, at the same time 
as uh, the miniature railways of Great Britain uh, were starting to do little giants. Little giant was 1905, and some of these Cagney railways that I've just shown you uh, um, were in parallel. It's just that um, less is known about them because they were less publicized. The showmen that built them just got on with taking as much money as they could. Right. So um, thought rather than approaching little giants by doing the engines one by one, uh, uh, we'd start by talking about who was behind them and try and say something useful, particularly about Wenman Joseph Bassett Loke, who you can see on that slide, and also later Henry Green. You know, obviously, uh, Bassett Loke died in 1953. I was born in 63, <laughs> so, I, so I'm not able to uh, fill you in on my meeting with him uh, firsthand, but there is a book about him by Janet Bassett Loke and published by John Milner, and there is a Bassett Loke Society, and there are also people, as we'll find out shortly, who are very interested in researching all that he got up to. So, so uh, I, I feel confident enough to make some comments about him. Uh, he was good at business. He could buy model railway equipment in the right quantity, uh, work out what markets he could sell it to and sell it as a profit. He was a really star communicator face to face. He could, he could write written prose and, 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 and present in a manner that communicated his, his, his enthusiasm and model railways as a means of staying young forevermore. He was really good at that. He was uh, still doing talks uh, very late in life. Um, human resources, that's a modern phrase for, for what he was good at. He was good at picking people that were good at, good at doing particular things. He picked Henry Greenley as a locomotive engineer. Uh, uh, he, he picked Ernest Twining in his organization. And, and as we'll see shortly, he, he, he set up different parts of his organization, all with key competent people in place. And, and he also had what I would call a devolved structure. Well, there's what I mean by devolved structure. That, that's, 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 that's the um, uh, company structure it. of uh, Bassett Loke. And, and I got that from this lady, Christine Sanderson, who's a volunteer at 78 Derngate in Northampton. And she's done a lot of primary research into the history of Bassett Loke. And uh, she, she sent me that on an email and said, well, of course I know that. Well, of course I knew it. You think I knew it? Uh, well, <laughs> she knew it. Uh, uh, so there it is. And what I'm trying to get out of that is that, is that there was more than one company. How it worked, I, I, I think anyway, is manufacturer and um, uh, uh, supply tended to be in different places and selling tended to be in one place because that's what Bassett Loke was really good at doing. He was really good at selling. That's something about the Bassett Loke shops to say that the Edinburgh shop was a bit more devolved than the other two. Um, well, Christine Sanderson has written some uh, lovely books. She's written one called um, uh, Art in Advertising, which is sadly out of print now. The one that's currently in print is this Bassett Loke War Workbook, and you can buy that uh, by going to www.78dernegate.org.uk. Uh, now, uh, I said that, that Bassett Loke was good at picking people. Well, of course, he picked Charles Rennie Mackintosh to design his two houses, to design 78 Derngate and then to design new ways. So that's another sign that this, this guy was an original thinker and he was really good at picking people. Mm. This man, I'd like to be able to say, was a true genius. Uh, 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 at Real Miniature Railway, we've got, um, I've been with his locomotives of the Albion class now for 30 years. And, and you know, in, in <laughs> working with them and keeping them going, you can see that the man that pushed a pen around the drawing board uh, to design those locomotives must have been really good. In, in, uh, I think that um, uh, we, we in our genre of interest all owe him a great debt because I'm sure that uh, had he not lived in the generation that he did, uh, Real Miniature Railway would never have been built and Rem Glass Nestor Railway would never have been regaged down to 15 inch. He, you can still go on uh, eBay now and search for Henry Greenlee 
you can find his distinctive name, fortunately, you can find umpteen books and papers that, that he wrote. Uh, he was very prolific in his day. And that advert which that's on that page, which comes from the inside covers of Models, Railways and Locomotives, that was that's an indication of what he thought his primary skills were, which is also interesting. The other, the other thing about him is that he was always independent. He was always a consultant. So I think I'm going to say that I think Mr. Bassett Lope was never his boss. Uh, they worked together. Uh, he was an independent consultant. I'd be interested in others that are watching, the, uh, Andy Nash from Romney. I don't think that Henry Greenley was ever employed in the sense that people are employed. I think the only boss he ever had was himself. And, and, and that's why he tends to dodge in and out of different projects through his history. Now, I hope that's accurate. Uh, again, Henry Greenley. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, how much of the man's work uh, still survives and, and, how, and how much of it is still operating virtually untouched from the, from the day he drew it. Right, we're going to go off on a short tangent now. <laughs> um, um, uh, I would like to know uh, uh, what the other members of the uh, archive group think about uh, wheel and track standards. Uh, uh, we have a variety of Greenlee equipment at Real Miniature Railway. We have a Bassett Lope class 10 and we have various Albion class engines. We have a lot of carriages and, and on our, on our um, uh, um, equipment, uh, we have more or less standard back to back of 14 inches. Okay, now, now there are people in the current railway genre that believe all these standards things are mightily important. I'll tell you that they are. That there are now, um, <laughs> so so uh, when you look at the R and R of the 1920s, my my belief is, as and I'm hoping that somebody will correct me in the comments if they think that I'm wrong, that when you're looking at Sans Pareil on the Ratty in the 1920s and probably Colossus uh, and maybe some of the carriages that came from Geneva. Um, you're looking at 14 inches back to back. But with the Hayward equipment, my understanding, because I checked this out prior to the talk starting, is you're looking at 13 and 5 eighths back to back. Well, um, you know, <laughs> is this important? Well, you tell me. Um, um, Greenlee uh, uh, knew about standards. Uh, um, before, in the era before the little giant was first designed off his drawing board, uh, he, he submitted a paper to the Society of Model and Experimental Engineers in London, suggesting that people that were going to build model locomotives build them in standard sizes. And he, he had four and three quarter inch gauge, nine and a half inch gauge and 15 inch gauge, for example, as his standard sizes. So, so he was in fact a he was in fact a standards standards guy, but where it does get interesting is we have all this early equipment that's fourteen inch back to back, and uh, and uh, be interesting uh, when the talk's over to discuss with our Romney friends. Uh, 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 I think that um, in the drawings of the the front drawing of the Green Goddess, uh, I think from memory the track gauge is fifteen and an eighth. And the back to back is more like Hayward back to back. I I greenly changed from the from the from the structures that he maintained since the era of Little Giant, the first one to be built, uh, and 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 he took the standards more towards what we're familiar with now, where where in mo in modern equipment non nominal 15 inch gauge, the back to back is is a bit less. And the track standard at times can be a bit wide. Now, I, I think in terms of future RER Museum archive talks, there's potentially a whole talk on that. <laughs> I've, tried, I've, tried to, I've tried to introduce it uh, with a view to uh, 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 it being an issue that we can come back to. And I'm not saying uh, that I'm the world's greatest authority on it. Simon, Andy here. Yeah. Um, Hello. Is 15 and an eighth on the straight? That's it. 15 and a quarter on the curve. Right, right. And what's the back to back? 
Yeah, having a sense. <laughs> <laughs> you make a good phone call. <laughs> well, variable, I think. Oh no, you're well, recording. I didn't say that. <laughs> yeah, I'm in that situation where it's been recorded as well. I, I'm going to move on from that. I've I've introduced the issue, and I, I suggest that especially a, a one a future one that we're not recording, uh, we could come back to it. Um, my friend Henry Greenlee. Uh, I hope I've said enough about him to say that I'm a primary admirer of his. Uh, uh, you know, he would have made a name for himself similar to similar to other designers of mainline engines had he not gone into the smaller smaller gauges. He did try his hand at all sorts of different things, and he tried his hand at um, this is the uh, station at uh, Royal Miniature Railway, which, as we can see, is is very ornate. And this is a closer look of, of let's say less good. <laughs> well, in my opinion, in my opinion. Now, uh, um, so so what he has achieved is he has segregated the people boarding from the people departing. But the people departing have got to get past this station master guy who's standing in the middle of the lad who's selling the postcards uh, and 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 i think my worry about it is is that the, in today's world uh, those platforms would be regarded as impractical and not wide enough um, i've just been on britain's newest railway which is the elizabeth line uh, and i can assure you that the platform but firstly the shed itself is in the most inaccessible place on the whole circuit uh, and secondly, that the point which you can see on the left foreground is facing the direction of the travel rather than trailing it. So, so you can imagine what would happen. Little, little giants are capable of quite a fair turn of speed. Um, they can do 15 miles an hour without um, too much trouble. So what would, what would happen if you came bowling around there with a train and the point was facing the wrong way? Um, so I think that I'm going to tell you that in my opinion, uh, I think that wasn't very good. So I think he got 12 out of 10 for his locomotives and sometimes a bit seven or occasionally even five out of 10 for some other things that he did. Um, this was another strange thing about Green and Bassett Loke and their concept of 15 inch gauge railways. Uh, uh, they were quite keen uh, on vehicles being four wheeled. <laughs> um, you can read it for yourself. Uh, uh, they regard a, a four-wheeled vehicle as being quite adequate. And that catalogue page from 1911 is also interesting because the, the enclosed vehicles are down at the bottom. They're at uh, Flewellyn's Miniature Railway Southport, which had only just opened. This is August 1911. So that picture was earlier in 1911. And what I'm wondering is whether Bassett Lowe did in fact make those coaches. They have, they're very ornate. And I'm, I don't know, I'm somewhat suspicious. Uh, 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 the catalogue page itself says that they make and supply bogey carriages with varying seating capacities. Uh, well, you know, they are. It also, it does say they make them. I, I think some of these things were, I'm guessing <laughs> that some of these things were in fact sometimes outsourced. And there's an example of Mr. Greenie and Mr. Bassett Lope uh, well, Mr. Greenley rather, uh, with his four-wheeled coaches, because even when he was bowling along the, the, the Romney and he knew he was going long distances, uh, he still provided carriages that were four-wheeled. In case you think that I'm alone in, in having, being a bit um, off message and criticizing one of my great heroes, uh, Henry Greenley. Uh, that's Albert Barnes from uh, Real Miniature Railway, and it was he that really got a hold of the railway, and he 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 commissioned Henry Greeney to to design a bigger engine, which is the Albion class, which we still have. Uh, 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 but um, he swept away Greenley Station, and he changed the the um, the uh, engine shed, being much more practical. Uh, and and over time, he also managed to get rid of all the four-wheel vehicles and had nice bogey vehicles um, with tramcar-type uh, bogies, which we're still using today. 
So, so, so if I have <laughs> reluctantly a mixed opinion of Henry Greenlee, I share it with another man in history, Albert Barnes. It's also interesting that, that Albert Barnes's six engines that he made, Graham Glass and Esther Railway never bought them, never bought one because they could have done, because uh, they were available on the market just at the time when the Graham Glass and Esther Railway most needed motive power. But by that time, I think that the trains and the moving granite around wasn't really suitable. Uh, so, so, you know, that was some history that didn't happen. Okay. Um, the precursor to Little Giants uh, um, was a train set built by Flukes and Smithies. And uh, this is an advert for Flukes and Smithies from uh, Model Railways by Henry Greenlee, 1904. And uh, there you can see on the bottom of the advert, it refers to the Nipper engine, um, two inch model, model tank engine um, called the Nipper. And, and there further on in the book, is, is a picture of the nipper being built. Uh, the interesting thing about that, the reason why I've included it, although it's a bit tangential to the main story, is, is that um, uh, um, this is a book written by Greenlee, and, and Greenlee does say that he's had a go at driving this engine and, and commends it for how powerful it is. And that's a question I also have from other members of the, of the archive group here. Does anyone have a picture of Henry Greenlee actually driving? We have lots of pictures of him standing around and being there, uh, but but I I think that driving and doing things that were dirty fingernail and practical um, wasn't quite his thing. I think he was a designer and he was very articulate, uh, both no doubt face to face and on paper. Um, but he wasn't one of these people like Van Zeller who's inclined to get on any engine that goes past and has that magnetic uh, um, pull uh, to get dirty all the time, which is <laughs> quite, I must say, you know, some of us are just like that, but Henry Greenlee wasn't. Um, this, this description of the Nipper Railway from the model engineer is very interesting to me because that top paragraph under miniature railway development is the paragraph that, that actually admits uh, um, that they were trying to achieve what the Americans had done before themselves. Uh, I don't know who wrote that, maybe it was Percival Marshall and it wasn't part of the standard uh, um, publicity that Bassett Loke and his friends wanted to, pull or wanted to put around. Uh, but uh, it is interesting uh, because of that, that, they, that, 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 that they'd seen what could be done by these little American engines and they, and they were keen to have a go at it themselves. And you could, you could quite see why with a man like Greenlee on board who could design any sort of an engine you wanted. Closer view of the um, nipper running at Northampton. Um, <laughs> I've included this picture in case somebody in internet land would like, me, like to tell me where that engine is. <laughs> um, that's 1905, so it's the same sort of era as Little Giant, uh, and by that time, uh, 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 Mr. Smithers has gone off and joined Bassett Loken Co. But, uh, but George Flukes, uh, very early on, built um, two engines like that, and uh, distinct as that. Right, um, this was the um, um, uh, premises on, in, at which little giants were, were built. This is a diagram of their workshop showing who, who worked there and what they all did. And this is the top half of it, and that's the lower half of it. And, 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 and you can see down at the bottom, Fred Green, the foreman's office. And if we go back to the earlier one, uh, uh, on the, on the right-hand side, you can see Jay Branston, which is interesting. And uh, I'll come back to him in a minute. Uh, uh, the interest, the, <laughs> what they didn't have uh, was a rectangular building with a flat plinth uh, uh, to build all these things. They had a very long, thin, thin building on various different levels, and 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 the only way they could fit a dash track in was was um, at right angles to it. So it was a very interesting place. Doesn't doesn't matter when you're dealing with model railways that are light. 
uh, I, the, the fact that your workshop um, isn't um, rectangular and flat doesn't matter so much, but it must have mattered when things were bigger than when things were big and heavier. So that's the inside of the erecting shop, uh, one of John Milner's pictures with various little giants uh, in different states of completion and the nipper engine uh, looking for its fate uh, in the middle background. This man, uh, Fred Green, uh, was the works foreman. So when you're looking at Sinolda and uh, Little Giant in Ravenglass Railway Museum, and you're thinking who was primarily responsible uh, uh, for building it, you're looking at him there. And, and, uh, and uh, he, uh, that's him in 1909, and he's testing out uh, um, the first prototype of their precursor model in seven and a quarter inch gauge. Uh, you can see that even to get a test track in, they've had to uh, uh, put various interesting bits of timber uh, underneath the track to get it anything like level, because their site uh, was not level. <laughs> right, this is one that James Waterfield sent me yesterday. Thank you very much, James, uh, and uh, very kind of you to to um, send me some some wonderful pictures from your collection. Uh, I'm assuming that that's probably the Entente Cordial type engine, and uh, there they are uh, with it. Um, more or less finished again in a very in <laughs> interesting <laughs> environment as regards levels. But I can see Mr. Bassett Loke, and I suspect I can see Henry Greeley not far from him. Uh, and the others you would guess are people that um, people that help construct it. Um, I have a I, I I have a question about this workshop here, which is um, were the coaches made here? Uh, what I can't see here. Is, is a woodworking shop that I would expect to see uh, to build four-wheeled coaches. So uh, I'm not saying that I know what the answer is, uh, but I'm saying that I'm a bit suspicious. One of the directors of um, Miniature Railways Great Britain Limited was a man called Trinary, and he was in the timber business. So that's a question I have, which is that we know that the metalwork and the locomotives were all built in this building, and they, they clearly had the facilities to do that. But the, but the, the, the uh, wooden, ca wooden carriages, were they made here as well? No, I just don't know. Um, it's another one of James' very nice pictures, and that's a class 20, uh, which they had an order from the King of Siam for, for a class 20 locomotive, and, and in that picture, uh, and they've got it um, almost finished. Right, it's a bit of a long story, this, uh, uh, but um, I'll try and keep it short. The, the, um, uh, the, the great heyday of Bassett Lope and 15-inch and, uh, gauge railways was before the First War, um, but they continued to advertise uh, um, model, model locomotives right up to the start of the second war and and the the locomotives that they particularly sold a lot of were seven and a quarter george v and a nine and a half inch gauge atlantic and uh, and roland fuller's book about bassett low uh, uh, it does say very interesting that that that, that after the uh, first war they they picked on two employees called braunston and walters and braunston and walters had been Time. So, so Braunston and Walters built it at Kingswell Street and they managed to rope in Henry Greenley, who was a bit distant from them by that time, to, 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 to do all the drawings and dimensions for them. And then they took it down to Harry Franklin's railway at Radwell to test it out. And this, this um, testing out <laughs> was, was rather a, a, an old boys reunion. Um, uh, so, so really that's the end of the heyday of Bassett Lope model engine building. The interesting man there is, is Mr. John Braunston with the Baryon in the left hand side. Well, I asked my friend uh, Christine Sanderson uh, and uh, using this ancestry resource, which you can get on the internet, but I don't understand very much. Uh, uh, she, she found the details on the right hand side about John Braunston. So, so in the context of Ravenglass Royal Museum, uh, uh, um, uh, he was working for Bassett Lope by 1911. So if the Sinolda uh, 1912 from memory, uh, 
he could have been one of those along with Fred Green that built it. He would have been quite young then. So, so there's a bit of a tangent uh, to try and keep up the tradition of the archive talks to try and talk about people as, as well as objects. Okay, uh, we'll do a, 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 a little bit of standard stuff about uh, early Little Giants. The first, first um, locomotive was Little Giant himself, itself. Uh, and the first thing they did with it is, as uh, Peter Van Zeller rightly said in his talk, was they took it over to the Eaton Hall Railway uh, to try it out. And the principal object of trying it out was to find out how fast it would go. And the answer was that it would do just under 30 miles an hour. <laughs> so that must have been quite interesting uh, for a newly built 15-inch uh, gauge uh, class 10 little giant. And then their first railway was this interesting railway at Blackpool. I'm going to show you a few pictures of that because that isn't, isn't treading on, on anybody else's toes as regards other railways, which I don't want to cross over into. So, so, so there's the railway at Blackpool. Can you see the train going, going about? It's got two carriages and it's in the middle distance on the right hand side. But it's a fascinating railway because it was laid down directly on sand. Uh, something you would never do these days, but you have to <laughs> take your hat off to them. Uh, they went in with both feet and, and uh, they did something that, um, that these days would be regarded as somewhat strange to lay a railway on sand dunes. So these are a few more pictures of it for you to see, uh, most of them culled from eBay. interesting obviously this engine is in Ravenclass Royal Museum now so that's why it's got some uh, relevance to you and this is its first location of operation and that's one of James Waterfield's pictures be interesting to compare that with the back head of uh, Little Giant now wouldn't it I quite like that one even though the image is smaller it does give you a, a, an indication of what what they were dealing with in this era and I, I know that we've mentioned this railway in previous archive talks but I hope you've had something of interest to see uh, pictures of it, Little Giant's first railway of operation. Um, the, um, the public railway of public record office is the company file for miniature railways of Great Britain uh, and uh, well, apart from the things like who the directors were and who the shareholders were and what dividends they had there's also this annual report uh, that was presented in 1910. And it says the season at Blackpool has yet again been disappointing. Despite the efforts of, lan of, of landlords to improve the fairground, the results of this year's working were not entirely satisfactory. The wet and stormy weather together with the sand troubles made it difficult to show good profits. Uh, and they therefore decided to close the um, uh, Black, Blackpool Railway and uh, take it to uh, Halifax. Um, Roland Fuller's book said that they didn't ex exactly lose money at Blackpool, but they didn't exactly make it either. And you, you do get the feeling that, 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 that when, when everything was working, um, the place was quiet. And when they were having difficulty keeping everything going, the place was busy. <laughs> That's just an impression. Um, a few more pictures. Uh, from eBay, you can see that's from eBay. Uh, that's their railway at the Nancy exhibition. And that's at uh, Roubaix. Very interesting, these are pictures. Now, wh why weren't those coaches uh, culled and taken to Ravenglass when they were desperate for um, good quality um, carriages at Ravenglass in the very early days? Of course, I don't know the answer to that. And, and that's the railway at 1913 in Breslau. And I think in John Milner's book, it suggests that the carriage is the same as the previous exhibition railways. Okay. Um, now I'm afraid uh, to try and concentrate the, the talk on different things. Um, um, that's all the early little giant railways I'm going to do. So I'm not going to go to Sutton Park or uh, Halifax or others um, that are all listed out in John Milner's book. You can go and read his book and I can't rival it. Uh, uh, so I'd rather try and keep going with things that I think might be reasonably new. Um, 
uh, Bassett Loke and Co. When they wanted to sell stuff, they issued catalogues. And in 1911, uh, they issued a garden railway catalogue, um, which I've already shown you the carriages, the, the 15 inch gauge carriages page. So as I've got the, an original of the catalogue, I'm going to show you some more pages of it. Uh, the artwork on the cover was particularly nice. Um, uh, um, seven and a quarter Immingham, uh, uh, Mr. Bassett Loke really loved artwork and, and the legacy of it all that he's left behind him is, is fantastic. Uh, uh, early picture of real miniature railway uh, on the frontispiece. Uh, you notice the date, August 1911, and uh, on and on about uh, uh, real miniature railway and various other things. Uh, and play Coatsley there, which I'm another place that I'm not going to stray onto, the Blakesley Hall Railway. <laughs> Hope that may be of interest, the original specifications and prices of Little Giant, um, like the one which is in Raymond Glass Railway Museum. And, and that's interesting because uh, see we've got Jordan Leeds with us and there we are, that's how much you need to raise, Jordan, £425 in 1911. Uh, to 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 buy a, a brand new Colossus from uh, Bassett Lowe. Interesting thing about that is that both of those outline drawings have got Henry Greenlee's signature right next to them. So, did Greenlee design them? Did he design the whole things, or did he des design part of it? I I don't know. I you know. <laughs> All I can say is that there's the catalog page and there's his signature. That's it. I, that's their idea of how to do track, which is a twelve-pound, interesting, quite, 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 quite light rail, or a twenty-pound a yard at a real miniature row. In no doubt, at Ratty, you're considerably heavier than that, and at the Romney. Uh, uh, but uh, but the, the Bassett Lope recommendation was for twelve-pound a yard. Um, in April 1914, uh, they did another catalogue just dedicated to. Uh, 15 inch gauge railways. Well, <laughs> you can imagine that uh, considering what happened directly after this um, catalogue was issued, they probably didn't get very many orders from it. But a um, copy of it does survive in the archives of the Bassett Oak Society. Uh, and I've got some rather poor quality images, images of it here. If you want to look at the whole thing, uh, go to Raymond Glass Railway Museum because there'll be uh, a, an electronic copy of it there. So here, here, here again, we have um, uh, uh, Gigantics and Saint Pariah and Little Giants together with their specifications and prices. Um, and, and there uh, we have uh, varieties of four wheelers. You can buy best quality four wheeler or you can buy a second grade. Uh, quality four wheeler, and the difference is that the the timber's a bit cheaper in the second grade one, and some of the um, uh, um, metal parts uh, in the cheap version are missed out. <laughs> but uh, but the, the it's interesting to see the see the bottom of the uh, four wheeler there, because because the the uh, coupling looks very like a present day ratty coupling to me anyway, and and uh, th that's a suggestion that I that I. I often believe, which is that these guys, um, some of the things they did weren't quite right, but some of the things they, they did were rather good. And, and they worked out how to design a, a, a centre buffer connector coupler, much like the Ratty use now. Um, uh, this, this has this uh, text, uh, which is probably difficult to read on that slide, which is the same thing again. It says, why bother making bogey, why bother looking for bogey vehicles when, when you can have four wheelers and they'll be just as good? <laughs> okay. Um, something about little giants that I think most of us that know about them uh, would be familiar with. Uh, this man, Robin Buttrell, in the center of the picture, um, uh, was a lifelong enthusiast of them. So you might say that people like me who were later generations got their enthusiasm from him and there's certainly some truth in that. So there he is in 2001 uh, at uh, Perigrove, got that picture from my friend Michael Cross and, uh, and uh, there we are, opening of, the, opening of the Haywood building. 
and and if you thought that his interest in little giants was was not over a um, uh, long period, there he is in 1944 uh, uh, writing to the to the locomotive magazine. Interestingly, he's trying to trying to place who built the the two steam locomotives at Margate, uh, Prince Edward of Wales and the Billy engine, uh, both of which are now at uh, Royal Miniature Railway. So, so that's an indication that uh, Robin's enthusiasm was very well established as early as 1944. Well, Robin, together with these people, Howard Clayton and Michel Jacot, in 1970, uh, they wrote this book, uh, Miniature Railways, Volume 1. Um, and, they, and they boldly attempted, um, very brave, I think, uh, to, to tabulate both uh, Albion class engines uh, uh, and little giants. Well, obviously, now this is 1970 and, and uh, at the moment it's 2022. So <laughs> I've got Captain Hindsight over Robin here and, uh, and uh, one does recognize that, but they did get one of two things wrong, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, the, the uh, John engine on that page should be 103, for example. Uh, and the Margate engine, uh, would believe, was there by 1922. So, you yeah, know, there we are. Uh, uh, the, the nice thing about this book uh, was that it did convey Robin's enthusiasm for the subject. Uh, uh, and it certainly passed that enthusiasm, documented it, and passed it over to later generations, which was very much of a good thing, even if some of the detail uh, wasn't always completely right. Right, well, this interesting thing is, uh, is uh, his attempt at doing the little giants. Uh, so so I, I thought we might approach that by whipping down them quickly and saying where they are now. Well, little giant rain glass roller museum, um, Marty Atom in a store in um, Sheffield somewhere. <laughs> Next three, don't know. Um, Prince Edward of Wales, Royal Miniature Railway. Uh, next lot, don't know. George V, um, California. Uh, Hungary, Bud Budapest. Um, Prince Edward of Wales, later King George. Th those 21 and 22 became King George and Princess Elizabeth. Uh, and um, coming back to those near the end of the talk, um, Sinolda Ravenglass Royal Museum, Sam Pryor, that's an interesting thing. Uh, you know, I'd love to spread a rumor that the Sam Pryor is in a garage in Whitehaven somewhere, but uh, I regret that conventional wisdom is that it was scrapped in the 1920s. Um, Count Louis uh, mentioned in a previous archive talk, it's in Andy Walton's works, Denver Light Railway, and, and, and uh, the John Anthony um, Colossus, uh, alas, um, scrapped. Um, there's a question you might like to try and answer. Um, I certainly don't know the answer. Uh, um, it, you can <laughs> you can work it out. Uh, you can work out the definite ones, but these ones that worked at exhibitions early on, um, uh, there's there's certainly two that aren't on this list, and uh, one is the Burt Wynn Class Ten, uh, which is in John Milner's purple, purple book, and that, that ran at uh, Geneva. Nobody much knows where it came from and where it went to. Um, so that's another class 10. And the other one that's related is the one that I'm not showing a picture of, which is the one in New Zealand. Well, I think that was made from castings. Um, I could be wrong. I, I don't know. It was imported from um, England during the 1920s. Uh, and you know the fact that the driving wheels and the cylinders look so similar to a class 10. Now I'm just speculating, but um, you know they must have had sets of castings for these engines uh, at Bassett Lokes Works. And by the time you got into the middle 1920s, certainly the castings for a class 10 wouldn't have been worth a lot, would they? Uh, so whether somebody spotted them uh, and then bought them and then um, created a, a locomotive from around them. That's just a little bit of speculation from me as to how the New Zealand engine might have come into being. Okay, um, we'll do a bit on the Sonoda now. 
uh, uh, because I don't want to uh, stray too far away from our subjects at Ravenglass. And now, St. Alda started life at uh, the San Hutton Light Railway. Uh, well, unfortunately, I can't tell you very much about that because I don't know the first thing about it. <laughs> I could get Paul Ingham's book and scan pages from it, uh, uh, but uh, I don't really want to do that. What I, what I, could, what I might point out to you is that the uh, original historian of this row was Ken Hartley, who's uh, last no longer with us. And, and uh, Hartley's friend and successor was uh, Paul Ingham. Well, and Paul Ingham wrote the book with uh, Roy Link uh, as um, publisher and uh, artwork man. Well, Paul Ingham is very much still around. He's a, he's a driver on the Festiniog Welsh Highland Railway. So, um, in future archive talks, if you wanted an archive talk on the St. Hutton Light Railway, you might be able to persuade him to give you one, you might do. And, and I'd certainly rather uh, that you ask him to give you a talk and to have, have it from somebody that knows about subject than my, my venturing on about it during this talk. Um, um, Ken Hartley never managed to find out what <laughs> number of times Conversations with Robin must have turned to this famous garage, and, and it, it, it proved that um, um, uh, uh, that uh, uh, engines can disappear off into places and then reappear again. Well, uh, this that I got from my friend John Tidmarsh is the originating source of uh, where that story of uh, the garage in Cricklewood came from, and it's an account of from uh, Nigel Parkinson. Of, of how the um, how Parkinson's railway at South End started and where the equipment came from. Uh, so the various interesting uh, facts on that page, uh, and, and 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 you'll notice that Parkinson had served his time on the Midland and Great Northern engine, so uh, Midland and Great Northern railway. So he numbered the Sonoda engine after his favourite Midland and Great Northern engine. So you wouldn't believe it, but but uh, uh, the Sonoda uh, actually has a connection with M and GN number forty one, uh, which is <laughs> the pitch the, the locomotive on the picture there. And there's the number forty one. Well, it's on it's on the head front at the bottom station there. And this this picture has always fascinated me uh, uh, because you can see there are frequent trains to Lakeside. Uh, and the railway goes through a subterranean tunnel, which is 100% beneath ground. And for the experience of, uh, of, of riding on this railway, um, uh, you buy a ticket for threepence. You can see how difficult it must have been, this South End railway, uh, 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 to build it. Uh, you know, the, the levels at that bottom station were impossible. So, you, so you've got a very heavy little giant engine uh, in the head shunt with all this timber supporting it. And, uh, and, and so there's the... You can see the uh, water tower there. I always, I always thought that that's a, a thoroughly lovely picture, and I would love to see. That's why I'm showing you in my talk uh, some pictures of Sonoda at this South End Row. It didn't last very long, opened in 1934, closed in 1938, but it was a, a lovely little row, and I'd love to get in my in my uh, uh, time machine and go back and ride on it. And now, but what you'll notice, something I've learned from the archive talks, uh, uh, you, you can have pictures and they were taken at the same time. So there's a, a, a first of a group taken at the same time. So that's the Sonoda uh, running at um, South End Miniature Railway. Uh, now, I'd love to tell you who the people are. I wish I could have Dave Simpson uh, uh, seconded to Real Miniature Railway for six months to try and tell us. Uh, uh, who all the people are in our pictures, because I know very little in all the pictures we've got uh, of who I'm actually looking at, and, and I don't know there either, sadly. <laughs> but what I can do, I can relate that back to the letter to John Tidmarsh, and you can see that that, that set of coaches is actually articulated. It was built in uh, Parkinson's workshops for this uh, very distinctive railway at South End. And you can see that, that, that the tunnel uh, was in fact subterranean, did go below ground. And you can also see uh, 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 why they had to have carriages with roofs on, because you wouldn't want anybody to stand up going through a tunnel. Uh, uh, it was an L-shaped, uh, this railway. 
and that's the that's the bottom station you can see the george v engine with its smoke box uh, uh poking out uh over to over on over to the right hand side and and here, here we have the sonola again uh uh hauling this time a uh, vehicle adopted from a basset loop four-wheeler and there's another picture showing what they did now i don't know where these four wheelers came from maybe the the peter scott book about skegness uh will will tell me because because the uh, skegness railway had four wheelers and maybe uh they came to south end along with the engine which was georgia fifth <laughs> but that's a lovely adoption of a of a four wheeler very very distinctive and you just wonder uh, what happened to lovely vehicles like that and that was the legacy engine that was there when the parkinson's moved into south end uh, uh, made by herschel spillman and that's what happened to the herschel spillman uh, engine it was uh, stuffed in the siding uh, uh, and uh, they didn't uh, use it very much obviously because they had the two bassett log engines there during parkinson's reign uh, now if you think that um, there isn't much information about this obscure little railway from the 1930s. Well, there's, a, there's an article in the Model Engineer about it. So that's that. So there's a page and a half of original script uh, of uh, telling you what it was like. And basically, <laughs> at that bottom station where you saw the head shunt up on stilts, there was a there was a, 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 a high, what they call a hydraulic buffer stop, and you went backwards out of the platform towards the hydraulic buffer stop, and then you then you opened up to get up the hill. You went through the tunnel and turned around right angles, uh, and then you went round a sharp curve into the stop station. And and you can see in the in the scan there that the Parkinsons had their own workshop uh, at Sheringham. So so that's where that um, Arctic set um, uh, um, of carriages was made. And and. Uh, and there's a similar text about the South End Miniature Railway in Dr. Walter Strauss's book, uh, Lilliput Barnum. And uh, this is what Strauss said. It's rather similar to the model engineer. And you, you do wonder whether, whether Strauss actually had the, the uh, article and, has, and has, uh, has used the same text. OK, so that's South End Miniature Railway, which, as you can tell, uh, I rather like. Uh, and and uh, after that, um, the Sonolda engine um, uh, railway South End closed 1938, according to that letter that I showed you earlier on, uh, and and the equipment then turns up at uh, Bellevue. Well, where it was in between South End and Bellevue is a known question, uh, because it's covered in this in this article in the Narrow Gauge written by Harold Botel in 1981, and and. The, the 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 purple passage is on this page here, which is which is that um, uh, um it was the Sonola engine was sold to to the Dunn family, and it was going to be used at a railway in the northeast, and then the, then the railway uh, at the northeast fell through, uh, um and the Sonola engine was sold to Bellevue instead. Anyway, it's all down there. But the um the Dunn family um later owned the railway at uh, Barnard's Castle, which what's become now Thought Light Railway. And Michael Dunn, who is a descendant of the family that owned the Sonoda for a short time, uh, 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 he's still uh, a very prominent volunteer at Thought Light Railway. So it just shows, it shows that in some cases it goes down the, it goes down the generations. Okay, I go through these pages a little bit quickly. The, the, a, a man called Robert Nichols has done a lot of primary research into the Bellevue uh, Railway. And this was an article which he published in the Narrow Gauge. Uh, and and, and he's, he ironed down what the different um, layouts of the railway have been over the years. It started off going backs and forwards alongside one of the avenues. And, and then that got adapted so that there was a return loop at one end. And then it went back to a, to a single station and run round. Then they had a go going backs and forwards alongside a lake. Uh, and and then they ended up going round in circles, 
um, same as Real Miniature Railway, but 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 on quite a tight layout. They had some sharp curves and heavy gradients, and and they had their station right in the middle of a public public area. Um, in the in the final years, Bellevue Railway closed 1977, uh, and certainly in the era when um, Harold Botel was there, uh, uh, it was quite well looked after. Uh, but but latterly, um, the old old uh, old gentleman who was engineering brains of it um, retired, and and the, some of the drivers um, were students. And one of those students was my friend uh, Malcolm Carroll, and he wrote his reminiscences about it in the Hayward Society Journal in 2010. So that's Malcolm Carroll's um, article. Interesting thing uh, in. Uh, in terms of the Sinolda and its conservation plan, which is how old's the boiler? Uh, because uh, Harold was there at the end of the 1940s, and he says that both the railway queen and the engine, the railway queen engine and the Sinolda engine, or Prince Charles as it was by then, uh, they were reboiled in successive years. So is the boiler on the Sinolda now um, um, the same boiler from the 1940s? Now I don't know the answer to that, but there must be. Uh, there must be an answer. You'd expect the conservation plan um, to cover, you'd expect the document that would say how old the present um, Sonoda boiler actually is. So there's Malcolm Carroll's article where you can see that um, there's all sorts of information about the Bellevue Railway. There's a cutting out of one of Robin Buttrell's scrapbooks. Um, there's a poor scan out of Robin Buttrell's Bradford Barton book. Um, a top, top view of it is is um uh, both both the Sinolda top top view is is in this station when they were running round and then looping the loop <laughs> and the and the bottom view is uh, when they tried to make it look like the iron horse um my friend Neville Knight uh, was a wonderful photographer uh, and uh, he liked the Bellevue railway and he was there regularly and and uh, he gave me uh copies on disc of a lot of his pictures it's interesting that the that the uh, prince charles or sinolda engine i think that's white that's on the tender there and and, and there appears to be yellow on the coaches i don't know but that that's in the area when they're going backs and forwards by the by the lake another picture when they're going backs and forwards and again can see that uh, Neville knew how to how to handle a camera, so he's left us uh, a, a rich legacy of pictures. Hmm. All your engine, it's an older, but in its life at Bellevue. <laughs> this sadly uh, was what I missed. Um, uh, it's a, a transparency that somebody took of the Sinolda that uh, came up on eBay, uh, but the transparency then became lost. So that muddy image. Uh, is the only one remaining of it, but there's there's that um, um, green livery, 1964. I th I think that the maintenance staff at um, Bellevue uh, they had a they had quite a big fun fair and they had a zoo to maintain, so they were used to painting things, and I think that they they painted the locomotives uh, pretty regularly. So over over the whole life. Uh, they were all manner of colours, the Railway Queen engine uh, uh, and the Prince Charles Sinolda engine. Um, the, the only one they didn't repaint was the Joan engine, which they got in 1970. Be interesting to see in a future life uh, whether you could make the Sinolda engine look like that, wouldn't it? That gives you an idea of, of how on the circuit um, the station was arranged. <laughs> yes. Um, and fairly fairly late on, I, I noticed when Vanzella was there in 1977, it was green, uh, but uh, before being green, it was definitely red. The railway green on the left in a uh, livery quite similar to what it has now and uh, Prince Charles oblique Sinolda on the right uh, in red. Okay, there's one that recently came
to open and shut the drain taps. So, so useless things that you didn't know about the Sinolda. Uh, um, that that was what it had at Ted Bellevue. Well, of course, the the Joan and the Railway Queen have uh, have still got that arrangement uh, fitted at Bellevue, and uh, underneath the cylinders are their their quarter turn plug valves, very efficient at um, uh, getting getting steam out. But 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 when it was at um, Sand Hutton, um, I'm going to say that it had uh, greenly uh, remotely controlled um, uh, drain tap controls because um, you can see underneath the, the cylinder the bar that controls them and and um, well uh, I know what they're like because our Michael engine um, still has them and basically there's there's two pocket valves that are screwed up into the bottom of the cylinders and there's spikes stuck down at the bottom and the bar underneath the um, cylinder goes backwards and forwards and in one position it allows the poppet valves to be open and in the other it closes them. So, it's, so I think the Sinolda engine has had in its life three patterns of drain taps. It's got the manual ones that it's got now that you have to get off to change and our Billy engine has got those. Um, uh, it's quarter turn ones fitted at um, Bellevue, like the Railway Queen engine, uh, and and I'm going to guess um, that it originally had greenly pattern with the poppet valves. Well, be interesting to know. Uh, I don't know the answer. Uh, uh, what the uh, little giant engine has got, but uh, clearly um, <laughs> became interested in that following Trevor saying that uh, he could uh, open and shut the Northern Rocks drain taps. Well, well, you know, in these engines designed by Greenlee, uh, they also had um, drain taps you could control from the cab. Wonderful man, Mr. Greenlee. And there's a, and there's a question that you can come back to when you ever uh, review what went on in this talk. Um, um, I'm saying it's been white because I showed you some white on the, um, on the uh, uh, side of the tender. It's blue now definitely been two shades of green it's definitely been red uh, uh, well has it has it been any any colors other than those uh, i think it would look good in yellow personally uh, i don't know it's interesting i don't know what color it was at um at um san hutton and i don't know what color it was at south end all the colors all the it'd be interesting to know whether it was midland and great northern covered at south end wouldn't it but it's certainly been so a, a, a lovely old engine, and it's been at different times every color of the rainbow. And there's the real purpose of my trying to talk about my trying to venture into saying something about the Sinolda. This Sinolda, uh, and, and and then it went in my railway at South End with the hydraulic buffer stops and the subterranean tunnel, and the inspiration from the Midland and Great Northern engine, and uh, then, it, then it ended up at Bellevue where it was painted all all manner of colours of the rainbow, and it worked on three or four different. Well, um, <laughs> you've got a long enough story uh, to write all manner of things about it, even even before it landed at Ravenglass. You think. Of Or, or, or a few about its life at Ravenglass, but it's a really interesting old engine. It's had, uh, uh, um, uh, if it could tell stories, it would be, it would uh, make a better job of uh, doing so than I can. Okay, uh, 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 here's an example of me uh, getting us. I thought it would be nice to, 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 uh, uh, and the closing part of the talk, to talk about these little giant engines where they are now and uh, what might happen to them in the future. Uh, and uh, I, <laughs> I like this artwork. And um, Mr. Bassett Lope was a uh, loved his artwork. And he 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 sent everybody a, Christ a Christmas card every every Christmas, and uh, each Christmas card had its own artwork. And catalogues had artwork. And this is a lovely artwork that he had drawn in 1928. That unfortunately I've I've had to uh, <laughs> adapt. Uh, um, I, I thought it would be nice to go to the future in our time machine uh, with Mr. Bassett Lope, but he was going in the past, towards the past instead of towards the future. So I've turned him round 
uh, but I've I've uh, messed up the initials on his briefcase, sadly, because they've been flipped as well as him. Um, Mr. Bassett, though, he had his trademark appearance, uh, and uh, one of his trademarks was his suitcase, and he must have worn it, must have brought it with him to Ravenglass um, a lot. And if you want to see his suitcase, it's in a glass case at 78 Derngate. So uh, uh, off we go. Uh, and we're going to the into the future now in the company of Mr. Bassett Lowe. Um, this for interest is what we're doing at Real Miniature Railway. Uh, uh, um, uh, we've bought this uh, engine which uh, Les Hughes has got his hand on uh, um, because because the man in the shorts uh, decided it uh, as we only own three urban class engines it would be a good idea to buy a, buy a fourth one and I asked him for three good reasons why we should buy a fourth one and he only, only gave me one reason which is why not <laughs> so there he is Mr why not uh, and uh, we've bought it so we now own four uh, and um, two on the left hand side are in working order been in service last weekend bank holiday weekend um, at the Michael engine which is over on the right we're just putting back together now so we could be in a position next summer uh, well, we've had all four of those in steam. I'm not saying that um, the Billy engine, which is the new one, um, worked at Dreamland in Margate. I'm not saying that we'll have that running perfectly next summer, but I, but I, I think we stand some chance of getting them both going on a 12 month, 18 month, and then we'll have to work out what we're gonna do with them all. Um, um, these are our two smaller engines. Well, um, the little giant at the bottom, that's a, that's a gentleman's light sporting engine. It steams very nicely. It, run, it runs all, run around all day uh, pulling three bogey carriages. It, it, it's a lovely little thing. It's a, I'm, I'm not saying that it's as uh, authentic as a little giant engine, uh, but it's certainly a great privilege uh, to own, an engine, own a railway, be running custodian of a railway that opened in 1911 and to have its original locomotive, um, albeit, albeit not many original parts. Um, the Cagney engine is something of a Marmite machine. Um, some people uh, just don't see the point of it. Uh, it is rather small, you are quite limited in what you can do with it, but it's a good little engine uh, when it's running within its own terms. And uh, those two engines, uh, um, you can see when they're bored, when they're 10 years, boilers are up so we've got quite a long way still to go with the Cagney and, and several years before the class 10 runs out of certificate. I must admit that we're probably looking for a more active role. Um, we have got all these engines in certificate, we have to display them a little bit better uh, which we've got plans to do and we also have to work out how we can demonstrate them um, more often considering that they're all in working order. Um, the um, Vintage Trains Charitable Trust is raising money uh, to, to um, get the Sutton at Birmingham Railway Museum now than they, than they had when that slide was captured. But uh, that's certainly going to be a, a centre of excellence for equipment of this type in the future. Um, one of the most interesting questions concerns these two engines at the top, Little Giant, uh, which is currently in the uh, Rain Glass Rower Museum, uh, and, and at the bottom, the uh, Mighty Atom engine, uh, um, which is owned by a consortium of people, the largest shareholders being the proprietors of Cleethorpe's Coastline Railway, and it's in the store at the moment. Uh, it's, it's, uh, um, not at the at the railway location. Um, I know there's a there's a, <laughs> a great friend of mine uh, who believes that the uh, little giant engine could in the future be returned to working order because it's been in working order relatively recently and it is complete. Uh, and there's certainly some arguments um, in favour of that. And there's also some arguments in favour of doing something more constructive. With the mighty atom locomotive and and if it had a replica tender uh, and a new boiler it too could be potentially made to work again in the future 
because it's got quite a, a lot of its original parts. It's got more of its original parts uh, than are shown in that picture. Um, in case you wondered when the little giant engine um, last worked, uh, Peter will correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, but I, I'm going to say that it was last in steam in May 1999 for the Hayward Society visit to the Saltburn Miniature Railway. And I suspect Peter was standing by the side of me when we were both watching it in steam. So the so the, the year it was last in steam was 1999. Um, <laughs> this is uh, uh, my being brave, really, but. Um, um, this 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 railway, the Pockley Wagonway, is at Beamish Museum, and, and it's quite a model of uh, what a museum-y type railway might be. Uh, and you, you you don't go very far, but there's there's some interaction always with the people that are operating the railway because there are uh, that's part of the experience when you go in Beamish. Um, um, they always they're always taught to relate to the visitors. So there's a bit of a learning experience going on, and there's a bit of a train ride, and you and 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 you don't necessarily go very far. Well, could that done? Could that sort of thing be done? Maybe at Real Miniature Railway, and maybe within station limits at Ravenglass. Well, I think it could. Um, certainly, think at Ravenglass that if you went out of the engineer's siding and into the carriage shed at the other end, uh, you could go up and down within station limits and provide. A museum -y type experience that might complement um, the the main train ride. I certainly think that if you wrote to Beamish and suggested that they should extend the Pockley Pop Wagonway, so you have a seven mile outward outward trip and a seven mile return trip, um, they would regard you as stupid. And there's a there's another question. There's an everlasting question that can affect um, little giants and and old. Um, locomotives like this which is how can we get this balance um, between looking after them uh, conserving them demonstrating them uh, explaining them it's not at all easy to do and, and certainly in terms of the um, r and &ER museum archive talks i think that uh, is something that could be further explored because there's many many possible answers to it um, this was when the contents of the uh, Carnforth 15-inch gauge railway disappeared off to California in 2000. And I, I, I'm speaking uh, at second hand here, but uh, basically what happened is that Bonhams were um, put in as uh, auctioneers and, and they had one keen buyer that basically wanted everything in the catalogue uh, and off it sailed to, to California. Well, since since it arrived in California, the two Bassett Loke engines, the Princess Elizabeth and the George V, um, have been quite well looked after because they've both been given new boilers uh, and they're both now fired on propane. But 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 the railway in California that they were intended to run on uh, hasn't happened. Um, well, do I think that they could potentially arrive back here? Well. <laughs> All I can say is, you know, it won't be me that brings them back. But you can, you can never say never. And, and if somebody with sufficient interest in all these obscure past railways started wondering whether it would be possible to get our hands on these engines and equipment from Carnforth, well, you know, <laughs> anything's possible. Just look at what's happened at Statfold. Uh, to, to see engines being brought back that we thought were long lost. Uh, this is the King George engine, which is in private hands in the UK. And, and uh, do I think that that one uh, will emerge and uh, start operating again and be a bit more visible? Um, yes, I do. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I think I got that picture off of Facebook and, and, and what the JCB is doing, uh, I have no idea. And uh, some who viewing the talk will know uh, who it is that uh, would like to shine a light at that engine. Um, getting very near the end now. Uh, um, we at Rill, and I understand you at Ravenglass, uh, received an email out of the blue from the people owning this engine, which is the Hungaria, uh, 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 which is at Budapest Railway Museum. 
uh, and and um, the email says that they're what that they've got it in pieces and they're trying to restore it with a view to um, carrying people at a quite a busy railway museum near Budapest. Well, uh, this is certainly going to be interesting if it ever happens. A class ten. Uh, um, um, pulling people at a busy railway museum. So uh, hopefully, sooner or later, somebody um, from our community will aeroplane out there and try and find out what they're actually up to. But it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of that engine there. You can see the tender's in quite good condition and it's definitely little gianty. And uh, if they try to start using that in their museum, uh, um, they're going to have hours of fun with it. Okay. Well, we're at the end of that talk now. We're at the end of the talk now, and I, I thought I'd finish today's talk where it began uh, with an entertaining advert from the from the Cagney brothers. Uh, and you must have seen by now how much I like them. Uh, and these these Cagney brothers. It, it may be that by the standards of today's health health and safety fashions, uh, that they were a bit poor. Um, things like wheel and track standards standards for maintenance and competence you never never they never wrote much about uh, and they never worried too much about um, whether or not you can see whether you're where you're going when you're going backwards and they certainly never worried too much about fitting brakes uh, uh, but but it was it was them who first thought up the idea of passenger carrying 15 inch gauge railways and um, certainly before anyone else and by the number of trains that they sold they were more successful than anyone who followed them because um, you know they sold between two or three hundred of them, and uh, nobody's um, quite rivaled them at any time since. Um, so, if you know, uh, wanted to know which of these two I prefer, um, you probably know that by now. That's the end of the talk. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I hope I've still got a few of you, and uh, I see there's uh, 44. Uh, uh, chat subject. So, so, but uh, it'll be an issue for you as to how long you want to spend um, looking through your chat. Okay, so, so, Andy here. Um, I, by chance, I found a picture today in a box of George Barlow's stuff. And I'm going to hold this up to the camera. Yes, yes. You can see it. And on the back, it says 8th of the 5th, 2003. Simon yeah. Townsend. Yeah, that's right. If people can't see it clearly. It's the Cagney outside what is now that's my house in Rolf Lane, which was then, of course, George Barlow's house. About 10 feet from where we're sitting. <laughs> but that's it. that must be your picture, I take it, Simon. Oh, you've frozen. He, he shot with the news under your thing. <laughs> <laughs> I only found it today. So it's quite, quite Very good. Chance. Oh, it's shame Simon's frozen. Yeah, he's on for. I think he's moving again now. <laughs> we, we we lost you a few points, Simon. Um, yeah, that's well. but I think we we all could fill in fill in the blanks of what you were were saying, and good. I think that's been a really interesting talk, and what's been well, really good. What it's is, done now uh, is the, the 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 stuff about the Cagneys at the start, which good. was away a bit with the idea that it was just miniature railways, Great Britain skipping round. 15 inch gauge railways. The, a lot of the chats, I think PVZ has been answering as Kate Banzella as we've been going along this evening. <laughs> um, Simon, hi, Trevor here. Hello, Stockton. Hi, all right. Yes. You mentioned earlier on about um, gauges and back-to-backs and one thing and another, and Andy and yeah. bobbed in with an odd comment. Our back-to-backs are actually 13 and 11 16th. All right. Interesting. And, and, and you know, to the layman, you've got a 15-inch gauge railway in Ravenglass, the Bure Valley, and Romney, but every one of them is different, as yeah. Andy said, about 15 and an eighth. All yeah. the wheel profiles are different. But if you take our standard carriage bogey wheel of a 12 inch wheel and a 13, 11, 16 back to back, yes. the critical bit is if you get to a gauge of 16 and a quarter, then you're off the road. 
Yeah. <laughs> so that, that's all I that's that's all I ever used to work to in ten years of looking after the track. Right. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's very good. What well, what what fascinates me about it is when we have these talks in the Ratty Archive group, and um, and we see all this equipment all bobbing up and down the valley in the 1920s, all 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 running together, and 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 you know that there's such a significant variation. Uh, in their in their standards. Now, I don't want to make myself out as being the world's expert on this, but it is it's remarkable how much variation there is between uh, railways that are nominally all the same gauge. Yeah, I mean, you've only got to look at some of our photographs in the, in say say the mid nineteen sixties, and you can see a train going up the valley with a sixteen seater open carriage, hmm. a four wheeler Dawson. And a Jaywick, right? You know, all all cobbled together to make a setup, and yeah. you know, goodness knows what the makeup of the wheel sets were like. But then you think about all the couplings as well, because <laughs> you, know, we had, you know we had juggle coupling bars and everything else that went with it. So yeah. not only you, not only you're talking even then in the sixties of indifferent track, you know, with probably three different rail weights. But then you have the the difference in the wheel profiles of all the different carriages, and and the joggle couplings to go with it as well. So you know, even not that many many years ago in the development of railways, uh, it's in sort of preservation, if you will. We, we've had all that to to think about as well. Yes, interestingly, one of uh, Steve Rogers at Romney recently measured what was nominally a, a twenty four pound. 24 pound a yard section rail, which is obviously over 100 years old now, and it was down to 20 pounds. So yeah. the rest of it's lying out in the marsh somewhere. Yeah. Lying, lying, <laughs> lying about. Anyway, I'll, I'll bid you a good night, Simon. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Okay. Cheers. Good night, good night all. Good night, Joe. Right. Cheers. Uh, you mentioned, I'm just trying to remember the things that came up. Henry Greenlee. There is a story in the, the book that um, his son-in-law wrote about him, Ernest Steele, about him wanting to drive a train to Dungeness before Captain Howie and supposedly lighting Green Goddess up early one morning and getting the lads to push the loco out the engine shed, past red tiles and through the tunnel, and he drove it to Dungeness and back. But there's lots of pictures of him around locos. Like you say, there's um, a bit of film of him when Goddess and Chief are in Bin's garage outside Romney Station. And they push the loco out in the pouring rain. Uh, he's there in his plus fours jumping around. And of course, there's that great picture of the um, of him sitting in the tender of Goddess when oh sorry, not sorry, I'm doing it myself now, of LZ1, because it wasn't called Green Goddess when it came to Ravenglass, but he's just sitting in the tender. Oh no, it was Green no, Goddess at Ravenglass. All the writing about it states that. It may not have had any more writing on the nameplate, hmm. but it's identified as. Green Goddess mm. several times yeah. in the publicity. Yeah, in the publicity, yeah. But I mean, mm. the nameplates were blank and the RH and DR didn't exist. That's why it had a blank. Oh, no, but what I'm meaning is they were talking about it as Green Goddess yeah. at the time. Sure. I mean, we know it's LZ1 and 2 and so on. Or yeah. was it 1, 2, and 3? Well, <laughs> yeah. Ah. yeah. <laughs> Where is number three? The time is up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and again, I, I, Simon, I would really love a copy of that poster of Henry Greenlee, that the, one of his own publicity one. That is <laughs> beautiful. If you could send me that, I would, I would really. It's be just a scan out of Christine Sanderson's book. Uh, 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 Christine, uh, as you know, she's a, a real digger, and she's discovered all manner of uh, things about Bassett Loak, uh, and uh, in her. Uh, um, art, artistry book. Uh, there's a section about um, Henry Greenlee, uh, and uh, and it's just taken from that. Uh, uh, I I would guess um, that you've not got a book, and no. unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, that's the one that's now out of print. Uh, uh, but I have tried to highlight her interest in this, and she's got this other war work book in 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 print at the moment, and she's working on several others. But, but the advertising one, um, I don't know whether they're going to reprint or not. 
but it's out of that and, and, and it's accompanied in the original book with all manner of wonderful artwork of Bassett Lowe um, uh, and, and an, an account of all the uh, artists that were involved in, in uh, drawing them. Yeah, um, I don't know about Greenlee whether he was actually employed by Howie or contracted. I would imagine he was contracted, but mm -hmm. all the paperwork from pre-war is gone. Right. And um, do you agree oh, with me? Do you agree? Do you, we've got some, we've got several, a number of great minds still watching, and, and you say, do you agree with me that he was fairly independent? Oh yeah, very, and very could be upset very easily by people who regarded him as his inferior. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, there's the whole story about him not being introduced to the Duke of York. Mm. when he came to Romney and that supposedly was what led to him falling out with Howie and and then moving on um you know he was within inches of the man and never got introduced you know the, I, I I can see why, why he would have been annoyed because he designed everything yes Not just the locos the coaches the bridges the, the track everything yes oh do yes Oh yes, that's time to talk to you now. Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing the association uh, has done just recently, we purchased from Austin um, the uh, the last sort of original four wheeler. Yes. Uh, talking about four wheelers, uh, which is in the process of a sort of cosmetically restored. It's allegedly one that went to port part of the original, the second order. No, hang on, no, the chassis. No, no. Was, uh, yeah, the, body the, was a, the, body, uh, the body was found on the marsh as a chicken chicken coop, but the chassis was one of the chassis that went to Porth Call uh, as part of the original order. And it appeared in 1977. Yep. Uh, and then uh, Austin took it and dig it, did it up, and he's now sold it. So we've now got it. We've now got one of the originals back. Very good. Plus one more chassis, but that is in such a bad state. It, it's not worth restoring it. Right. Um, but we have it as a rusting hulk on display. I, I don't know. Hmm. Someone painted it red at one point. <laughs> and sort of holding it together with it. Yeah. Are there are there are there in Stuart, you can see these 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 chat comments. Are there are there any significant corrections or cock-ups of things that, that, that we should <laughs> No, Correct. Um, Before we all go, all go. Marie, Marie thinks um, it mentions in One Man's Railway that Greenlee took a salary from the company, but shamefully he's not got a copy with him watching the, the computer at the moment. Give me a minute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, but then the question arises: just how accurate was John Snell? Yes. Well, um, the, there is a bit of discussion about Sinolda's name um, and um, the Glenclaw Folk Museum in their former capacity as project manager here at Ravenglass Railway Museum did quite a bit of digging and research, I think, and we do have a bit more derivative of it, but I can't remember at this time of night. <laughs> and neither can Dave. Um, but we will share that at some point when we, uh, Dave and Peter, and uh, want to writing a Snolder book by. Right. So we'll, um, we'll we can put that in the the background. <laughs> Do you know how old the boiler is on the Snolder? Um, it is the nineteen forty nine. That's right. The, the nineteen forty nine one. It's had right, a interesting. patch on the bottom of the barrel. Right. So, so that coincides with Harold's notes, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And of it, course, it, you know, what you end up with is that slightly different, um, what should we say, uh, turret valve. And there's some alteration to the cab that's happened after that. But I saw one picture from your um, South Endy pictures, I'm sure. Uh, appear no, sorry, not South End. Bellevue. And that appeared to have a safety valve bonnet round yeah. the tall safety valves. Right. So if that ever emerges, <laughs> <laughs> it would really add something to the loco. Right. There was question about the odd cylinder, um, which I think Peter answered was a result of the incident where it ended up on its side at some point. 
Um, and in the drain cock discussion, St Alden now has steam operated drain cocks because at oh, the really? last overhaul, um, our modern drivers who can't possibly get off the the loco to do it, um, the, 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 and Mr Dibble no, no. doing it, he put that on. So that's um, so that's, so that's four, four types it's had. It has, yes. But they also found when they were, the, there was quite a bit of digging into sort of structure of it. And one of the wheels still has green paint underneath the blue, um, <laughs> which was quite nice to find. And one yeah. of the wheels is different from the other three as well. Uh, a different diameter, I hope. No, 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 they, they are all round. Yes. <laughs> Um, and um, Jordan had mentioned about the New Zealand loco being assembled at Dunedin Works. Um, and there was some comment about Little Giant's current tender being the one that was in the photograph with one of the London to Paris locos, um, which I'll have to go and have a look. Um, mm. and have a, a nosy round um, but certainly from when we were doing some poking around a little giant a few years ago looking at things with other learned people little giant isn't as unoriginal as some authors have led people to believe um, and so yeah um, we can go and do a bit of investigation on that um, Dave got very excited about the Bronston things because that name had come up in some things that we received recently um, and so here in the archive so Dave may be following that up a bit more with you um, because there's reference to Bronston in some documents we've received recently right um, and there was some discussion about whether a modern human would fit in a basket loud coach um, some people say definitely, and some people are not so sure. We'll will not be uncharitable about why that might be the case. Um, and um, someone's comparing Greenlee to H.G. Wells and his visionary um, style. And interestingly, um, that's mainly the comments. You, you um, so you you've got away quite lucky to some extent, Simon. <laughs> I got a little bit here on. Greenlee being employed or not. Apparently in 19... Snell's words are, in 1925, Greenlee was commissioned to sort of look into building the railway. And then once the LRO had been appointed, five people as original directors of the Romney were Howie and his wife, Captain Holder, Major Bell and Henry Greenlee. The maximum number of directors was also set at five. Greenlee, however, never acquired more than 50 shares and so was never qualified to sit on the board. So he was a director and was commissioned, whatever that meant. Um, but yeah, you know, going in with Andy's comments about being sort of, you know, snubbed by Greenlee, by, by Howie by not introducing uh, the, the Duke of York, you know, he seems to have been very much shunted into the sidelines, doesn't he? With only meaning, you know, well, you're a director, but oh no, you haven't got enough shares. Terribly sorry, you can't sit on board. You know, it's uh, smacks a bit of uh, um, master and his servant. Sort of thing. Um, you just reminded me as well, there's a little clip of film of a four-wheeler behind the engine running into Dimchurch in the very early days. And it's got some Clayton Pullmans riding behind it. And the Pullmans are riding as smooth as you like. And this four-wheeler is bouncing up and down all over the place. And this is only at level crossing speed and stopping at the station. So what they were like when supposedly they used to run in the low to mid thirties everywhere, God only knows. Mm. Mm. I don't, I don't, I don't, I think it's, I, I don't know, I, I, I've got more questions than answers about these carriages. Uh, there was definitely a man who was into woodwork, who was latterly the managing director of MRGB. So when you're seeing that catalogue in 1914 with all these descriptions of the types of timber, uh, you've got to think that, that, that he 
had a had a hand in that because he was there. He he had a big stake in it. He was latterly their managing director, and Timber was his expertise. But there's got to be a reason uh, why they thought these four wheelers were very good, and I just wonder whether they made different types of uh, uh, bogey vehicles, and they certainly didn't settle on a single type, uh, and therefore they they. They ended up going back to four wheelers. It's, it's, it's definitely anything when they made the railway at White City, uh, they had bogey vehicles there and they, they tipped one on its side. Um, uh, so it might be that that made them like four wheelers because uh, they had a low center of gravity. Well, Dave, Davis talks about the Romney four wheelers having to be tied down if they wanted to do any work on the chassis. Mm. Yes, jo Jordan's just commented that the timber specified for the underframes of the coaches was Danzig Oak, as used in shipbuilding. Right. Um, sounds very technical. Um, but because um, you, you've got the remains of a, a four wheeler now at Rill, haven't you, Simon? We have. We've got the remains of more than one. We've, 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 um, yes, we have. And we've got to work out what to do with them. Mm. Yes. <laughs> I, I, unfortunately, we confused the issue by buying another steam engine. So, 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 so we're now stretched in every direction possible. So, 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 having spent all this money getting another steam engine, we might we might concentrate on that for eighteen months, and then we'll have to come back to the four wheelers. Uh, Dave has said that will give him time to, to do some research into it. Because <laughs> um, I, although I, I, there was quite a bit of research done some years ago here, we haven't revisited it since that time. Um, right. And, um, the, it's that sort of fresh eyes and other things have come to light since that was done. So, um, mm. yeah. Um, but there's the, there's books on all these subjects. Whether anyone would buy them is a different matter. But there's books on them. <laughs> in mm. the making. Yes, <laughs> and uh, we, we'll think about doing the 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 track standard talk in future. <laughs> we may need to get Mr. Stockton to help us. So I think He's elected, doesn't he, in his absence? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> We'll, we'll, de we'll delegate that while he's not here. <laughs> well, there's, cer there's certainly exciting stuff on the horizon for little giants um, with what's happening in Birmingham and, and other places as well. And now that you essentially have nearly every barn's look on um, at uh, Rill is quite good too. Um, so yeah, lots of nice things are happening. Well, talking of Cagney's, uh, Simon, I was in Cuba about uh, five years ago and was in a mining museum and there was a Cagney in there, 15 inch on a plinth. Right. Um, I don't know if you know about so that. It's, surpri it's surprising. Uh, so the reason I, I played the film at the start is to let Kerry Williams, who's done this primary Again. Near a lady talking somewhere. Yeah, I don't know where it is. <laughs> There's only four of us that aren't muted. It's yeah. Not... <laughs> we missed it, Simon. <clears throat> you yeah, yeah, you, you froze oh, up when you were talking about Kerry. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll, 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 I'll say it again. The, 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 uh, the reason I played the film uh, was to let Kerry talk about that history side in, in, in his own words, because he's, he, he's the man who really knows about it. Uh, and, and, and the remarkable thing is, is the number of them that they sold. Mm. And those, those people who've worked Cagney's sometimes beyond their working envelope, um, they are very surprising game little engines 
Uh, yeah. In challenging the history books, the class tens must have been exceptional if we believe what's written, because a Cagney will do things that you wouldn't believe if you persuade it. Mm. Well, it is interesting, isn't it, that Bassett Lauks didn't commercially succeed mm. in the same way, remotely the same way. Um, now, was it difference between British culture and America where, <coughs> what should we say, enterprise, or was it a more leisure in America that generated more opportunities for people to have, uh, you know, the holiday and the um, entertainment that a holiday in inverted commas or leisure time offered? Well, well there's something interesting there, isn't there? Because mm. again, they sold, they went to different places on the continent, but not many. And they went to extraordinary places, aren't they? Breslau, uh, where there are two engines, there's another engine picture for Breslau. Um, it's a hell of a long way away. And aren't there lots of places in between waiting for a, a miniature railway? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Make a good point. Yes. And I said, we will never know now. We can only. <laughs> yeah. yes. Oh, yes. lovely. Mm. Oh, the fascinating thing for me, though, was your photo over the cab of Little Giant with its tiny fire hole. And <laughs> the one thing that's continued from the very start of Little Giant through its subsequent reboilering and new firebox is it's got its tiny fire holes still. Right. And I think there are only two Bassett Louts with the tiny fire hole, Little Giant and, um, come on, the other one. The, mighty Atom. The Mighty Atom, thank you. Yeah. And the first improvement they made was make a bigger fire hole so you could get a bigger shovel <laughs> in. <laughs> and what, what drain tap arrangement does the Little Giant engine have? Because you would know that. Sorry? What drain tap arrangement does the little giant engine have? Oh, something underneath, isn't it? Wiggly yeah. box. Rod, rod there's, a, there's a linkage. Right, right. Yeah. 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 I mean, the, the stuff that came, it came from, sorry, it's an older came with, you know, all that rigging on that you saw. Uh, yes. And quite why it got taken off, it was the period where I was um, out on the track gang. So, you know, you only came in once a week in, sorry, once a week to the big city lights of Ravengrass <laughs> <laughs> in the wintertime. And that's when they were doing things to St. Alda. So I don't know, I never quite worked out why that rigging, they mustn't have liked it. Um, and, and it's all disappeared before the engine went into paint shop as a museum quality. Oh, the man trying to sell us something. Yeah, George, <laughs> no, no spending £50,000 on a Class 60. Well, it's not a bad price. Yeah. No. You could have got a River Esk for £36,000 in modern money. So <laughs> oh, oh sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Simon, I've just something that I think this is the last thing you mentioned that I made a mental note of. The drawing that you showed of Green Goddess in profile. That was actually a post-war, quite a long time post-war, because it had its Ashford tender behind it. All right. The I earliest bet. drawing I've ever seen is dated June 1924, and it's a blueprint from Paxman's, and the loco has, surprisingly, a Great Northern High-Sided tender. Right. And the, it states on it, um, loco for Count Louis Zabrowski and Captain J.P. Howie. Right. You know, there's some some discussion about who, who actually ordered one and two. Well, yes. That appear to say that it was both of them. And yeah. then... Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be my understanding, that there was there's, the, they, there's, they there's, ordered one each. Hmm. Yeah. There's, there's, there's no historical significance in that side elevation of the Romney engine that I showed. It was just, it was just all I had that was handy. Uh, so it's, it was it's 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 it, 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 it's off the top of uh, 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 the RHDR letterhead that I found in one of my old files. Mm. 
so it's so it's not the uh, locomotive uh, uh, in its original form. I'm, I'm, I think I've got in my other headquarters um, Locomotive Magazine 1925 uh, with a description of Green Goddess in it, and I think that I think that's got the head-on drawing with the 15 and the eights in it, and I think it's also got the back to back on it and I, I haven't got that with me uh, and but I might be able to get it next time I go up there mm -hmm. yeah we can um just to complete the picture Ryan has dashed downstairs and come back up with the news that um, the just, uh, little giants um drain cocks are um, manual valves, but with a reach rod back to the cab. Simply, <laughs> best way. Right. So right. I think we will draw a close there. Um, okay. And um, we will be back. Are we back the first? Okay. First day of Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I try, tried to cover a lot of ground yeah. for you, and I hope yeah. it's been of interest. No, it's been super, Simon. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. All right. Cheers. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Good night.